So here we are, sharing secrets of the soil with me, your host, Regen Ray. Hello, soil lovers, and welcome to another episode of Secrets of the Soil. I'm Regen Ray, and today we're going to dig deep in soils with Brian, joining us from New Zealand. How are you going, Brian? Very good, sir. Yourself? Yeah, good, good. Always learning and digging deeper, and I'm excited to have a chat and hear about your history. Share with the community what you what, what got you started with soil. Well, I, I was brought up on a dairy farm in uh, in New Zealand, near a little town called Pitaruru, uh, which, which is a volcanic area and a very interesting area for dairy because it was um, in the uh, 1920s and 30s before my time, but uh, cattle suffered from uh, what was called bush sickness. And so farmers were actually given land to try and farm it, but it's actually, in a long story short, it was actually discovered to be a, a cobalt deficiency, which in the... Uh, in Australia, so it's sometimes called it coastal disease. And once the, it was actually discovered, uh, and what got me interested, of course, was because farmers after the Second World War were using certain types of cheaper fertilisers, and the people that used the cheaper fertiliser didn't have bush sickness, and they were able to isolate out that cobalt was the missing element. And and um, and then I was very interested in agriculture right through. I loved animals, loved dairy cows, and... Um, and after my high school, I went to Massey University for a couple of years and studied daring. And one of the problems with going to university, it, you have higher expectations of yourself. And uh, so after that, I went uh, share milking, then uh, farm ownership, <coughs> excuse me. And then uh, I looked for consulting jobs. But uh, one of the problems in um, New Zealand, of course, or any country is if you're not part of the academics <coughs> uh, fraternity then those opportunities don't come around unless you start up by yourself so I was able to join an organization and started consulting and and we were consulting in soil plant and animal nutrition and the association between soil and plants and the resulting animals and uh, so it became a very interesting challenge I traveled to many parts of New Zealand and uh, then in the 1980s I had the opportunity to go to South Australia and uh, on a visit and I caught up with a Rural Youth Exchange member who was a, a Grantley Dodd, and uh, Grantley was well known in South Australia. He's passed away now, and uh, he invited me to come back and and do more work in South Australia. So it was a very interesting challenge um, when you take ideas from one land to another, and and they're totally different. It's quite a challenge because you 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 know the idea is when you move from one country to another, you should risk respect the ideas in that country first before you start practicing them. So I didn't do any of that. I just started practicing what I knew and uh, working with orchardists in the Adelaide Hills and et cetera, et cetera, and dairy farmers on the Florio Peninsula. And we were getting very good results. Um, I was then invited to uh, consult for a company in Perth and they had uh, franchisees, 80 franchisees all around Australia. And I actually traveled uh, through Western Australia New South Wales, Victoria, and South Australia running workshops under the Farm Biz Scheme. And that that gave me a great insight into the different soils around Australia. And, you know, people don't realise the difference between the states and, and the soil compositions. And then I was also invited to go to China and uh, ended up in China with a soil testing laboratory in a place called Kaifong in China. And so that was a great um, insight into <coughs> the soils in China. And so... And then in um, the more recent time, I was uh, contacted over the internet and I ended up working in uh, Japan as well. So looking at soils in Japan and then you slowly can put all these soils together because wherever you go, the soils are, can be totally different. And it's just been a great, um, a great adventure working with soils and seeing how you can change a soil and change uh, animal behaviour, change plant nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a... There's a lot of stories there to uh, put together, but uh, <clears throat> there's been some great, great results. And uh, I think from a regenerative farming point of view, I was working with a, a grower in, uh, up in Northern Territory. I never ever visited there, but <clears throat> he actually told me that after two years, he had reduced his spray bill by $800,000. Wow. So he must have had a big spray bill, but uh, <laughs> just showing you how you change the soil, you can change the quality of the plant, you change the way that the predators attack the plant, and you can get a better quality product. And so, yeah, so I've had 
and I've done work in um, South Africa and uh, um, many other Vietnam and oh, yeah. Samoa, but I haven't visited all those areas. But I've, I've been asked to comment on soils in those and and, and Holland and. Uh, so you've traveled the world. <laughs> traveled the I world. haven't actually. I haven't actually visited all those countries. It's just soils. <laughs> yeah, the, the internet is a is a great thing, and uh, yeah, so I've had a lot of contacts and been had a lot of invites and, uh, and 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 a lot of fantastic results just by looking after the soil and changing the soil. Yeah, I love that. I've I've always enjoyed our chats that we've had in the past as well, and some of the content that you've created uh, on our Soil Learning Center and for our members. And I've really always had those kind of mind blowing understandings uh, around that. I want to touch on a point that you made that you started researching the connection between soil, plant health and animal health. Do you remember what year that was roughly? Well, that was in, uh, when I started working in 1978 and 1980. And one of the fast, one of the fascinating things is that one of my dairy farmers in, that, that became a client in 1978 he is still a client today, and so every year I've done his soil test since 1978, and uh, he, he um, just follows what I, my, my advice, and uh, he he can't understand why his farm's still green in the summertime, and now the neighbours are going brown. But uh, he's a very low key farmer, but he's make, he's the most profitable farmer in the district, according to his local bank manager. Wow. And so that's really cool too, in the fact that he doesn't have to understand how it works; it just works, you know. And that's mm-hmm. that's really. Really, really, really cool. What's your thoughts on the fact that you've been looking at this since, say, the late 70s, early 80s, and we're now 2021, and we're still having to try and convince people that this is the way to farm and the way to nurture our our soils? Mm -hmm. Are you seeing hope there, or are you frustrated some days that it's taking so long to see what's so clearly obvious? it, It does get frustrating because, I mean, I think Japan was a great, 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 um, Adventure because I was asked, I went there to problem solve because one of the issues in in the world is when you plant a farmer plants his seed and the crop fails he wants to grow, blame the seed and so this this importer in uh, a seed importer in Japan who was a pioneer seed uh, importer he was having problems with clients blaming the seed but I was able to quickly show his clients that it was nothing to do with the seed it was their bad fertilizer programs which had been advocated by the local fertilizer supplies, and a lot of them are very knowledgeable people, but we, when you're looking at soil balance and we talked about the pH, understanding pH, and that puts a whole new new bend on things. And and the other one was um, that, I, that I've worked with a lot, and it's, it's probably a bit controversial, is, is uh, in Japan, it was, they used a lot of compost, um, cow manure, rice husks, and, and, and that was a really wide opener to seeing the excess compost being applied was actually quite detrimental to the crop because the, bi- the biology in the soil couldn't handle all that excess compost. And, the, and as we've talked about before, compost is actually a fertilizer. And so it, it has a big nutrient content. So because they were using cow manure, which is very high in potassium and phosphorus, that was actually suppressing things like manganese and magnesium. And so it was actually because they were using it so and so continuously and so so after such a long period of time, it was causing major issues in the soil and creating a very bad soil. Not saying compost is bad, but it's just understanding that the wrong compost can be bad for your soil. Yeah, and that's definitely um, one of the things that I took away from chatting and hanging out with you was the fact that sometimes people get excited when they put an input or even it could be organic or natural and they get good results. They think that if they put more of it on, that's a good thing. Yeah. And your highlighting of excessive means mm. is sometimes mm. worse than a lack reading. And so that was a real eye-opener from my world, especially coming from tech and startup where everything's bigger and faster and better. Um, mm. That mentality might not... And it doesn't work with nature. <laughs> and, and that's the other thing is, is, is the, the frustration is there because I see a lot of the working with dairy herds and with sheep and et cetera, et cetera. And large, uh, like an example, a large farm in, in, in on Kangaroo Island was 10,000 sheep and they had a 60% lambing percentage. Now I did what you said, did the technical thing. We, 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 we tested the soil, we tested the pasture, and we knew the blood tests and the animals were just extremely low in selenium. The soil was low in selenium. <clears throat> and so I, at that time, there was no selenium fertilizer available in, in Australia. There is now, of course. And so we imported some from New Zealand and applied it to the property. 
But we made the mistake, we just applied it to the grassland. Now, the, the great thing that happened was the first year after we applied the selenium, his lambing percentage dropped, jumped from 60% to 110%. And that was just by addressing that one limiting factor. Then what happened was when he weaned the lambs, he weaned them onto his stubble country. And the stubble it was just stubble. And, and of course, they immediately went into a selenium deficit. Wow. Because we'd only applied it to the pasture. Mm. So the learning curve was that, so next year we applied it to all the cropping ground as well. And when the lambs were weaned, there was no selenium deficiency. The dead stalks contained enough selenium to maintain them and um, give a great result. So those are little learning things that we must be careful mm. and understand. And, and so there's some, some of the frustrations I have, as you mentioned now, of course, is I see the same things in human nutrition. We're, we're getting to the point where <clears throat> plants, of course, according to the FDA in America, Food and Drug Association, the vegetables we're growing today have 30% less nutrient value than they did 30 years ago. Mm. <clears throat> There's two reasons for that, of course, and the same happens with pastures. And this is where your multiple species comes in because <clears throat> pastures are being grown or bred for volume. <clears throat> and vegetables are being bred for volume and quick maturity. Yep. And so as, as you grow a plant faster, whether it's for animals or humans, you would dilute the nutrients which it contains. So you've got a dilution problem in those vegetables and in that pasture. So situations like New Zealand, for instance, where they, we're growing lots of grass for milking cows, we now have the situation where, where the majority of dairy farmers, of course, are feeding about three or 400 grams of minerals per head per day as a supplement. Because mm. when I was young and growing on the farm, there was none of that. But the species yeah. today are growing so much more dry matter. We're getting up to 18,000 kilos, 18 tonne of grass per hectare being grown in some areas, whereas the average is sort of about 12 or 14 tonne. And so as we increase that and we use more nitrogen as fertilizers, we're creating dilution. Yep. And, and, that, and that's really what we need to understand with our fruit. Well, not, fruit's not a problem because fruit's grown in a slower environment. So, But as we grow multiple species... Those multiple species, of course, is like having your, what they advertise in Australia, your seven and your, your, your seven plus a day of vegetables. And the reason you have seven plus a day of vegetables because every vegetable planted in the same soil or every grass species planted in the same soil extracts different levels of nutrients from that soil. <clears throat> and that's with your multiple species. One of the issues I've seen with the multiple species, though, in some of the, your, your photographs is there's a lot of bare ground there that needs to be filled with something and a lot of a lot of grazing. There's a lot of trash left on the ground. Of course, that trash that's left on the ground, of course, oxidizes and goes to the atmosphere. But um, no, but it, it, there was a lot of frustration when I when I hear the, the animal health. I'm sorry, the human health issues we have today. The majority of them could be cured with diet, because I've, I've, I, you can go into a, a, a herd of cows. I went into a herd of cows in an area here in New Zealand uh, a couple of years back, and. The young calves were lasting about seven days and then they were dying. So they had a veterinarian looking after the, the calves, trying to find out what the problem was. <clears throat> when we walked around the herd of cows, the dung was a funny colour. <clears throat> the cows didn't look quite right. And we, on, on analysis, we found out in this particular case, the crop they were feeding was very low in protein and very low in phosphorus. Now, fodder beet is a crop. I don't know how much is grown in Australia, but it's a very popular crop here in New Zealand for wintering on because yeah. it has a great volume of product. But it's very low in phosphorus and very low in protein. So we introduced more protein into the diet by, by the form of uh, grass silage and some, some oats. And, you know, within, within a week or so, there was no more – none of the calves were dying. Yeah. It's just so amazing that we've just moved every system into like quantity rather than quality. Yes. It, it's mm -hmm. just such a bad metric um, to say that we're growing more or we're creating more of something. We, we, we fast track the growth rate by X percent and no one's actually stopping to look at the nutritional value, the taste, the aroma, the texture. And then it just means we need to buy more. So instead of eating two carrots and filling 
um, full, we're now having to eat four carrots. Um, so sometimes when we have it, this dilemma of feeding the world, you know, my kind of thoughts are, do we just need to slow down, grow better quality food? And do we just all eat less volume and higher quality protein, yeah. you know, high quality food that nourishes the body and the soul rather than just eating because we're told seven, seven a day, six times a day, you know? So, um, it's, it's, it's the right. What do you talk about? So we about higher quality protein. So what is higher quality protein? See, a lot of work done in Australia on human nutrition shows that the worst, one, the worst vegetables for, for nutrition are rocket, cos lettuce, and spinach. Wow. The, re the reason being is they're very high protein. People always think they're getting the protein from meat. Mm. But those vegetables, of course, are running about 35 40% protein because protein is nitrogen multiplied by 625 and that's because there's 16.5% nitrogen and protein. So 16 multiplied by 6.25 equals 100. So, and so they, they don't, people don't understand that. And of course, those vegetables, those, those bags of fresh leafy vegetables, the nitrate levels in them are very high. And nitrate protein is toxic protein. It's toxic to animals. So it's got to be toxic to humans. But anyway, so that, that but that's uh, one of my frustrations is that, 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 uh, because in, animal, in animals, we have, I had a herd of cows in, uh, in, in, in um, Brisbane, at Queensland. The farmer rang me and he said every cow, he had every cow that was calving was having a dead calf, it was still born. And I said to him, what are you grazing fresh growing lucerne? He said, yes, I am. I said, well, fresh growing lucerne is extremely high in nitrate protein. So we changed the diet. And a week later, he rang me and says, all the calves are being born alive now. Wow. Wow. And that's just diet. Yes. changing diet and, and that's what your multiple species are doing is you're giving lots of different opportunities of different mineral status i mean one of the issues in china was that if you've if you've some of them been to china the area of land in china is called a mu and there's 15 mu to one hectare and they used to grow about uh to get it right used to grow about 90 70 or 80 or 90 kilos of grain per mu they're now growing 900 kilos per mu so it's about 1.5 done or whatever per hectare. And, and the reason, and now, now they're finding, of course, they're doing an investigation when I was there a few years ago on why the, the wheat now is so low in vitamin B. Mm. And I said to them, what is the dilution factor? And they hadn't really thought about that. And that's really what we're getting at. We're getting that dilution factor. Mm. <clears throat> And understanding that is then making better decisions, asking better questions. You know, this is yes. what educating and understanding how the system works, even just understanding how our own bodies work. And, you know, just your example, like I read an article a couple of weeks ago about the fact that anything that gets called a superfood starts diminishing being a superfood because it then starts getting such high demand that the growers have to grow more, not quality. And so the mm. superfood attributes of it get lost very quickly. So it's actually better to eat non superfoods because they're growing slower. No one wants them. The farmers keeping them in the ground longer. They're getting better nutrient values and um, you're, you're, you're eating better quality food, you know? So all this marketing stuff, encourages us to eat more faster and quicker is just what's actually degrading our, our own body health and, yeah. and mm. the ecosystem. But we, we, we can combat that though. We don't have to, because that's where if, if the farmer is based, doing his basic soil test to start with and correcting the nutrient deficiencies, because one of the things that, that, that I sort of take, um, I guess, ex exception with is that people think the farmers have destroyed the soil. But there were very few soils, like in Australia, that were, were capable of producing good crops originally. Because in Australia, you've got high potassium soils in New South Wales. So the crops there are very high in potassium and they, 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 they lodge and, and they don't fruit well, as well as they should. In Victoria, we had very acidic soils. In South Australia, you've got the high magnesium soils, which are lack air in the soil. And in Western Australia, you've got these sandy soils, which are very low in potassium, very low in calcium, and, and very low in manganese. And of course, when the farmers put on, I was working with the university over there many years ago, uh, one, of the, one of the lecturers, um, his name was Muhammad, and he, and he was, he was um, wondering why when he put lime on the West Australian soils, the crops failed. Now, the soil test showed they need lime. But what's happened when he put the lime on, he suppressed the manganese. Mm. And the lack of manganese caused the crop failure. 
So it's a matter of looking at all the limiting factors. Yes. Yeah. And that's where your soil One testing creates another, you got to understand all the pieces of the whole rather than just looking mm. at one piece of the puzzle. So if you're going to put lime on a soil and your members need to watch this one, if you're going to put lime on a soil, you need to know what your manganese status is. And if your manganese status is very low, you will create a manganese deficiency in the crop and the crop will lodge. Mm. And that's a common on Kangaroo Island. They're working with farmers on Kangaroo Island. Once we lime the soil, they had they, their crops were, could go backwards, but if you put if you sprayed the crop with manganese after when it was growing, there was no problem. But if you didn't spray it with manganese, you had a problem. So this so we need to be aware that when we're looking at soils, we've got to look at the soil test, the plant test, and then make sure our fertilizer, whether it's compost or whether it's fer, whether it's coming from a fertilizer company, whatever, you got to make sure that fertilizer is matching those limiting factors in that soil. Yep. And, and that, that's a big thing around the world. I mean, in, in China, I'm sorry, in Japan, for instance, I was, I was a farmer. I was, we did some tests where he had excess, manganese, excess magnesium. Now, he was asking the client, the, the fertilizer company for lime, but they didn't have lime. They had dolomite. So they were selling him dolomite on his high magnesium soil. And dolomite is made calcium and magnesium. So he was, was actually exaggerating his problem because the fertilizer company was supplying them with the wrong product. Wow. And that's where, that's where you know, all these your clients need to know that not only do they need to be able to understand their soil tests, they need to be able to check that the, the fertilizer company is giving them the right product. And, and, and that's a great thing, a big thing in, in, in the, the world today is understanding and be able to question Dr. Albrecht, who you know I follow his findings. He always said you must be able to test the soil tester. <laughs> and how do you do that? Test <laughs> by understanding your your soil report yes and that, and, that, and that's the important uh, issue there and, and you can just i mean a soil soils are so fantastic i mean you can manipulate that soil to do what you like you can restore the soil or you can cause degeneration just with your fertilizer program yep and, and that's, that's really hard for some people to hear because like they feel like they're doing the right thing, but mm. they don't realize that underlying they're mm. actually causing more, more, more damage than, than, than good. And it's by no fault of anyone apart from just a lot of people don't know how this soil functions, you know, and this is why I've gone down this path and this journey of just learning and digging deeper into soils to learn as much as I can. Um, because it is about sometimes self-education, like what you said before, like test the soil tester. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a really good point to make. And, uh, we, we probably need to do that in a lot of uh, parts of our world is no, you know, we don't just take the the data verbatim, you know, say who's saying what, yeah. why are they saying that? Who funded that research? Where is this data coming from? Um, what narrative is it trying to support or not support? So one of the big problems in New Zealand pasture is low magnesium. But our past, our soils originally were, were high magnesium. But what's happened is people have been liming for pH. So when the pH is low, you put on lime to raise the pH. But the first thing lime does, of course, it, it knocks out magnesium. And so we're getting our magnesium going from, say, soils where maybe 15% base saturation are down to 4, 5, 3, 4, 5, 6% base saturation, which is too low for healthy pasture growth. Mm -hmm. So a lot of farmers now are switching to dolomite. And dolomite, of course, is magnesium and calcium. Now, in Australia, you've got many, many sources of dolomite. Uh, especially in South Australia and I think in New South and in Victoria. But in New Zealand, we've only got one source of dolomite and that's at the top of the South Island. There's a dolomite mine. That's the only one in New Zealand. So dolomite becomes a very expensive lime source when you're trucking it, you know, the length of the country. Mm. But it, but even using small amounts of it is giving fantastic results in, in stock health just by increasing the magnesium percentage in the soil, you're increasing the magnesium in the pasture. And so there's, it, it's, it's understanding what you've been saying. There's, it's, when you put on one element, if you do too much of it, you're going to suppress another. Yeah. Yep. And that's where you need to be aware. I mean, you get into the, the bottom end of the York Peninsula in South Australia, where the soils are 90% base saturation calcium. And a crop grows there and the crop will just go yellow. And you spray it with manganese and it flourishes because on those high calcium soils, you, there's no manganese in the soil. So the crop just goes yellow from lack of manganese and it'll just, it'll just collapse and, and, and die. But one spray of manganese sulfate 
and it's wonderful. Love so there's, it's understanding that we can we <laughs> there's there's such a close yeah you know, people talk about organic farming, but there's such a close relationship in organics. I mean, you can't just take a farm and become an organic. You've got to actually address all these issues as well. And I've been working with many organic farmers over the years, and and it's it's just so interesting to be able to change the quality of their crops. And you can't, if you've got a good, well-balanced soil for organics, you can't tell the difference between looking at an apple from an organic farm and looking at a conventional. They both look as good. Mm. Yep. Looks can be deceiving. And and mm-hmm. you've mentioned this a couple of times about regenerating the soil or restoring the soil. I'm curious from your point of view and visiting via the soil so many parts of the world, what does the word regenerative mean to you? Well, I, I, I guess true. Re- there's, 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 I find we've got to be re- um, we move from idealistic to be realistic, and 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 understand. And re- true regenerative farming is understanding taking soil samples and a good soil sample. And you've got a lot of your clients doing soil samples, and some of your members you're, you've had talking on your talk show, shows is, is understanding the soil, taking good soil tests, understanding, and before you do anything is putting on the limiting factors for that soil and understanding what they are. As we talked about, compost can be good or bad. So you have good ones for this soil, but it might be good for another soil. And it might be bad for this soil. But true regenerative farming is, is bringing the soil back to its natural, uh, not bringing it back, is creating a natural soil. Because if we, go, we look at Dr. Albrecht with his work, what he did was he, he went to soils around the world with, that were naturally fertile. And it was the, the, some of the areas of South America, uh, South Africa, sorry, the uh, prairie plains in uh, in America, and some parts of Europe. And then he found the, the soils with their ideal animal health was good, and et cetera, et cetera. And then he replicated those soils. And that's what I'm saying. And sounds like uh, working extensively in South Australia, you've got these massive magnesium soils. And the trees there, of course, um, in some areas, when the, once the tree gets high, it just falls over because the root system is just sitting on the, on the, on the surface because there's no air in the soil. And so regenerative is taking a soil and making it, I was going to say making it perfect, but maybe not quite perfect, but making it as perfect as possible. And you can do that with your soil as long as you're doing your, your basic soil tests and make sure you're doing all, like here in New Zealand, some of the soil testing fertilizer companies offer a free test, but it's a very basic test. You know, it doesn't cover all, all the options. So you need to make sure you're getting a soil test, which you can pay a bit more for, get everything tested, and then understanding the importance of all those elements. And and then your, your plant tests. So, so making sure your plants nutriently testing okay. But I always say to people, you can't soil test from plant test because a plant test is showing you what the soil is allowing that plant to uptake. So if you've got a bad soil, people say to me, why doesn't this plant test look like the soil test? Well, they never will. Mm. Because the plant is taking up what the soil, the soil balance is allowing that plant to take up. And then, of course, if you come in and, and if you're growing a good crop, you can come in, you can spray nutrients on that crop. And it's understanding the importance of those nutrients because most of the nutrients you can elements you can spray onto the crop are considered organic. Like all the sulfates um, are organic. Boron, because there's no organic, naturally organic boron, you can boron is allowed to be and boron is a natural product anyway, but you're allowed to, uh, in organic farms to spray boron. So that becomes a critical element as well. And 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 I guess when I look at what I've been doing over the last 40, 50 years, has been is actually regenerative soil. And it just fascinates me that, because when I started doing what, what's happening today, I was considered a quack. It was yeah. quackery. And now it's becoming more and more accepted. But it's but we need to think more deeply about what we're doing. I mean, one of the things I don't understand, and you might have been, you know, I don't know if you've talked to Brenton yet, but is is lack of cultivation because some soils like high magnesium soils you need to cultivate the lime into that soil you can't just put it on top it may, it, it, it'll work eventually but when if you want to work a soil and get the microbes working in and the bacteria working you've got to create a home for that soil and if you build a home for your family when you first get married and you, you live in a little flat and you're going to have children you've got to make a bigger bigger house and you get a bigger car so you're actually creating an environment for that family yeah 
And you've got to do that with the bacteria in the soil too. You've got to create a home for those bacteria to flourish. And if you get a high magnesium soil or a high potassium soil, they'll struggle. I mean, the high calcium soils in South Australia where they've done a lot of trials with microbes and et cetera, et cetera, that it all fails, mainly because the high calcium soils, there's no air space. Mm. Very powdery. There's no real structure. Yep. And so the high, the, the high, calcium, uh, high magnesium soils, there's no air space. And so we can change that by introducing some calcium and et cetera, et cetera and introducing some air. And sometimes <clears throat> the problems with, with cultivation is there's a lot of over-cultivation <clears throat> and the bad machinery. Some machinery will create pans in the soil. Yep. And so there's no air getting into the soil. So it's... Yeah, and I think is, what you're saying there is really, really powerful because I, I feel like sometimes coming from this space, you might learn a new technique like no tilling or zero inputs. And we can get a little bit stuck on that and think that, you know, obviously in this conversation, you've spoken about, you, you know, disturbing the soil to make the right con right environment or, um, you know, um, uh, adding some inputs, whether it be a spray or, or, or some form of input. I feel like sometimes we pigeonhole regenerative agriculture into this principles and we think on day one, we must do all these principles a hundred percent or it's not regenerative. And I think what you're highlighting and not what I've seen from your work and what you've shared um, on other programs is that um, you got to do the right thing at the right time to make the soil better and get it close to perfect. Hmm. Sometimes you need to cultivate that property. Sometimes you need to add an input and it's about the journey of getting the soil where you need to get it. Hmm. To. Um, and that comes with knowledge and understanding, you know, your ability to know if you're going to put this input on it, are these other elements lined up to create the perfect environment? And I think that is really uh, an important distinction to do yeah. the right thing at the right time for the best interest of the soil today, um, not what you want your soil to be in 10 years' time. Yeah, well, a lot of the modern machinery creates pans in the soil, like the power harrows yeah. are terrible at creating a pan. And, you know, we've got to avoid doing that. I mean, one of the issues with, with cultivation is uh, living in South Australia, you know, after when, when April, May, uh, after all the cultivation, Adelaide would get covered in dust clouds and when it rained, it would rain mud onto, this, onto your car and your city, et cetera. But, you know, Albrecht was all about stimulating the biology in the soil. So if you're actually going to cultivate, what we recommend is putting some, some, some nitrogen on that soil first. And when you cultivate it, it stimulates the bacteria in the soil and they multiply into trillions and decompose all the trash and form a nice, beautiful crumb structure. The excretions hold all those particles together. Now, I've had farmers tell me that the, far, the, the areas they cultivated with pre-plant nitrogen against the ones they didn't, and the only ones that blew with dust were the ones they didn't put the pre-plant nitrogen on. In other words, the ones that didn't have the bacteria or the microorganisms stimulated were the ones that went blue. The ones that were stimulated, there was no blowing, the pasture was, the soil was perfect. And that's what, re, what regenerative agriculture is about, is getting those microorganisms going in the soil. And you can do that several ways. You can inject bugs into the soil to get the right ones. That can be successful and non-successful. In a lot of cases, it is successful. But, but if you actually stimulate the ones that are there, you'll get the desired ones. And the, the most important thing is that the nitrogen and, and phosphorus availability in the soil is governed by the bi biological activity in that soil. So if you increase the biological activity, you get more available phosphorus and you get more available nitrogen because they're, they're dying bodies, which I think the life cycle is sort of seven to 24 hours. Their dying bodies are actually supplying nitrogen to your crop. Mm. And so it's a very good way to get that soil working very quickly and to, and to get that structure going. That and, uh, and so it's, it's I mean, I've, I've, when you go around to different parts of the world and you get faced with, I got faced with in Japan with, with asparagus coming up out of the ground, it looked like a banana. Mm. And you may have seen those photos. And, and, and which is a phosphorus deficiency. So the researchers were trying to solve why, because they had a thousand parts per million of phosphorus in the soil, why it wasn't getting into the plant. The reason it wasn't getting into the plant is because they had a depth of compost plant, uh, you know, ice, uh, rice husks and um, cow manure this deep. And at the bottom, it was decomposing. Mm. While that decomposition is going on, those, those organisms won't supply any nitrogen or phosphorus to that plant. 
So the plant's going phosphorus deficient, going nitrogen deficient. And so we actually had a case where they couldn't, you can, you can tell a farmer to take it all away, which I did on many cases, <clears throat> or we added extra nitrogen, which is not a, probably one of those four letter bad words, but we, we added the extra nitrogen, you know, within a week. The asparagus was coming up straight because the bacteria stimulating the microorganisms in the soil, they completed the decomposition very quickly and then started feeding the crop. Fascinating. I just, I have, you know, the more I learn and the more I understand this, the, the, you know, the more, uh, you know, I think sometimes it can feel a little bit overwhelming, but I think partnering with experts or mentors such as yourself who understand how these systems work um, is, is a, is a, is a great blessing for people to really partner with. I, I know that sometimes I, talk to farmers and they're going to agronomists or their local ag shops and they might not be educated to actually understand how some of the things that you've explained today um, function. So I think it's really important that people partner with other like-minded people such as yourself to give them a new view on what their soil tests are, mm -hmm. you know, what it's like looking at all those parts. And I've been able to identify that, look, yeah, this, this, mineral is there, but because you're doing these other things, which is proactive and kudos for you for doing it, but it's actually putting a negative effect for now. Then once we fix this or we balance it correctly, then we can continue with, with that practice. I think that's a really, um, uh, a distinction that we need to kind of make and, and understand. And we're not expected to know everything about no. all the systems, you know, we don't understand even how our own body biology works, let alone should we know how the soil one works. That's why we go to doctors and others who are able to understand that and look at our bloods and, and make assumptions. Mm. From that. And we've got to treat our soils the same. And yeah, one of my first challenges I was in 19s and uh, 1980s, I was invited to go to Western Samoa in the Pacific, and, and uh, we did some soil tests there, and they came back at 40% um, base saturation magnesium and about 20% calcium, which I'd never seen that before because the pH is all in the eights, but uh, high pH, but very low calcium. And, of course, those days there was no internet. So we had a service in New Zealand where you could go to the local research centre and pay uh, pay a fee of about $100, and they would send your infant questions to a, to a university around the world that, well, that could answer the question. Wow. And uh, that would take one or two or three weeks to get an answer. <clears throat> and then it came back with the high magnesium soils and, of course, Samoan soils, uh, very old soils, the same as the central red soils in, in Australia. And they matched the two of them together as being about the same age and uh, then explained the situation of high magnesium. But there's, there's, those, those challenges just teach you more all the time. And, and, and that's the real fascinating thing about soils is being able to take those soils and say, well, we've got this problem. How can we fix it? And we fix it. Yep. And now we can jump on a Zoom call and do a virtual consult from anywhere yes. in the world and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and solve problems quicker than ever. So uh, I, I love that. I think we could talk about soils and uh, your knowledge for, for days. One of the questions that I'd love to ask all guests on the show is if you were the soil, what would you say to us on the planet? Can you be the voice of our souls for a moment? Tread carefully. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, understand me. Understand me and look after me. Treat me like your, your child. Understand me and uh, be gentle. Understand my needs and understand what I can do for you. I mean, this, the soil is worth more than all the gold in the world <clears throat> because that's what, that, that's, that keeps the planet alive. And there is, there is some misunderstandings, of course. Is, I mean, well, the objective is to get the microorganisms going in the soil. And of course, to get the, to get them going, we need a home, and we have to create that home. So, so the soil is saying to us, create a home for us, cr create somewhere we can work together, and uh, and understand me, and listen to me. Yeah. Because when you walk across a paddock, and you see some, and and you'll see it in some areas, you'll see some cow 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 pads that are just drying out. And they're still there months after the cattle were grazed. You know that soil's dead. There's no life in the soil. Yeah. You can walk across a paddock, and, you, and, and what I do, I used to in Young Farmers Club in New Zealand. We used to judge pastures, and and, and I was when I managed to come second in New Zealand in one year for judging pastures. But that's no big deal. But the fact is, you would look for the bare ground. What percentage of bare ground is there? What variety of species are growing here? 
And how can you how can we improve that? If there's bare ground there, there's a, there's a problem. If you're grazing your pastures too long, you'll create bare ground mm. because what's happening is that the plants are shading out the big plants are shading out the little plants. And so you know the soil is saying, "Help me, help me, get some more plants." And uh, and and so it's it's a matter of if the soil's all wet and there's no drainage, you know, why why am I in a bed of water? Yeah. Why, why, you've got to keep, keep me dry and warm. And uh, you know all those sort of things that the soil can walk across. I mean, when you walk through a herd of animals, just the animals can you can look at and the animals can talk to you whether they're they're, they're healthy or not. And you know I've seen. Uh, you walk to, and of course, I don't know, you see a bit of it in Australia now with antiphytes in the grasses. You walk through a young mob of young, young stock and they'll, they'll, they'll move and then start falling over in the autumn time with the, with, the, <coughs> with the antiphyte poisoning. And I've seen herds of cows falling over. So what are you going to do about it? How can you help me? So there's all those issues that if you, you've just got to walk and let, let the soil and the animals and the plants talk to you. Yeah, absolutely. I think all for too long with like the soil has been out of sight and out of mind. And that was the reason for starting this podcast is to bring this topic of soil top of mind for everyone and give it a mm. And I love what you just shared there. I want to just reinforce it is like tread lighter, treat me like your child because I am worth more than gold. I think that is just perfect voice of the soil. So I think soil lovers, when you're out in your paddocks this week, today, tomorrow, um, whenever you get a chance, just think about that in the back of your mind and uh, listen to the soil and, and treat mm. it as it is your child that is worth more than gold and tread lightly. I think on that note, we're going to wrap up. Thanks, Brian, for coming along and sharing all your gold nuggets uh, with your soil wisdom. I always love hanging out with you and, and sharing uh, and talking soil. If our soil loving community wanted to hang out with you more, what ways can they hang out with you? Well, I guess they have my email. It's quite easy. I'm quite happy to answer, answer questions and I, I I do a lot of voluntary work now for people with soils, and uh, and it's a uh, it's a subject which is is I guess you look at the grey hair that's been around for a long time. When I forty fifty years ago, I didn't know a lot, but but as you work and look at soils, your knowledge just grows, and 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 you you, can, you just have to um, accept this, this extra life that's coming out of the ground. And and I always tell people out of one handful of soil. There's more life than there is people in the world. Yes, and and you have to understand that when you walk past a garden and you walk walk down the lawn, you just admire that piece of soil because you know there's so much life in it. Yep, love that. And we treat it like dirt, unfortunately. So we need mm. to change that narrative. And the email to get in contact with you will be around the show notes um, or around the video that you're watching. Um, I can be a testament that Brian has helped our members in the Soil Learning Center tremendously and come onto our virtual classrooms and shared soil tests is even helped with my own dad's veggie patch soil test analysis. And we use that as a case study in one of our virtual classrooms. So definitely um, someone with lots of knowledge and a heart of gold and gives that knowledge to us all as a gift. So I really want to appreciate and acknowledge your um, expertise and guidance that you've given a lot of our members and even my own father. So uh, thank you very, very much. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you, Brian, today. I love digging deeper with yourself and with all our community. So soil lovers, if you're out there listening, get outside, get your hands dirty and keep digging deeper into your soils. I'm Regen Ray for Farming Secrets. Well, soil lovers, that's enough secrets for one episode. I really hope that you enjoyed all the secrets shared during this conversation. But hey, let's not keep it a secret. Please share this podcast around and make sure that you like it and leave us a review because that really helps spread the secrets of the soil. Until next time, remember, get outside, get your hands dirty and keep digging deeper into your soils.